Haiti is a country, two centuries after its bombastic inception mired by the effects and ramifications of a revolution that frankly wasn't supposed to happen. August 14, 1791 brought upon the communion of various enslaved people across plantations in the colony of Saint-Domingue, not unlike many others beforehand. Gatherings such as these were seen as harmless, yet barbaric dribble by French plantation owners, but they were also golden opportunities for cultural and political exchange. These Africans escaping the grips of slavery in the mountains or maroons as they began to be referred as band together to emancipate themselves, abolish slavery, and begin anew from the ashes of colonialism. This night established a coalescence, united by the voodoo priests and priestess Tutsi Bukman and Cecil Fatima, alongside the resolve of the Maroons. One can often hear this ceremony, known as Bwakaima, and others like it chalked up as Haiti sealing its fate to be a country doomed to be destabilized. You know, Napoleon the Third and whatever. And they got together and swore a pact to the devil. They said, we will serve you if you'll get us free from the French. True story. But the Bois actually reveals a glimmer of a people's potential being realized despite otherwise dire circumstances. A potential that was called upon from the ancestors that preceded them and intentionally passed along to the descendants that to this day struggle to be free. It's imperative then that the revolution that took place afterward is not viewed as just an anomaly, but an anomaly that was always bound to happen solely due to the system that these extremely marginalized people existed in. The spiritual element introduced by voodoo practitioners, the multi-ethnic background of the participants, these characteristics contribute to the aura of unreality surrounding the event. It only feels overly fantastical to anyone not viewing the historical context in its entirety. Now, I always welcome people to learn more about Haiti's history. If anything, to just at least be familiarized with the complexity said history has. It's plenty of pieces of media that have depicted or adapted events from the Haitian Revolution out there too. Though there's never been anything really interesting or engaging for me personally that I'd say Hollywood at large has done depicting this specific point in history. Ah, but you see, my dear viewers, that is where the power of God and anime come into play. The Castlevania brand is large enough and has been around long enough that it doesn't need much introduction. Castlevania is a Japanese gothic horror series, accompanying games that center on the family clan of vampire hunters, the Belmonts, and their generation spanning battle with the Dude of Darkness, Dracula Vlad Tepish. Some of the most popular and well celebrated games of all time exist in this series, usually with Dracula as the final boss. They quite literally are their own genre of video game, alongside equally as important series Metroid, but truthfully, I haven't played through nearly enough of the games to consider myself a big fan of them. Played like the third one a few times. I like playing Richter and Smash. You know, very, very casual. It was really the Netflix adaptation where I found myself more interested in the lore, the world, and the overall vibe one would imagine comes from a world where you kill creatures of the night with a whip. I fell in love with characters and their stories, the themes explored, the goddamn animation and music like i honestly recommend it to people even if they have no idea about the castlevania games that the show is actively adapting after the fourth season ended i felt as though the story wrapped up nicely despite some gripes i had with how the story ended up there then one day they dropped this teaser a new show set in the universe now set hundreds of years later with a new cast most likely adapting another celebrated game this time Rondo of Blood since Richter's here, we are truly back at this point. Now some folk want their video game adaptations to be one to one, exactly how the game story is, but now on the big screen. And for a lot of series I'd argue that's the best way about getting it done. The Castlevania? Even across game series alone, you know what I'm saying, it evolved, added, took away ideas that didn't work and did work. 
there's not a definitive way to make a Castlevania story. There's multiple good ones that don't always do the same thing. I'm not really married to it being one to one here. A lot of the things they took liberty with in the source material ended up being really interested to watch in the anime. So as long as they cooking, I'm like not going to complain all that much. As more began to be revealed about the background of the show, its cast, I was getting more and more intrigued about how this show was going to go. And then she showed up. I mean, look, I, I knew we were going to be in France and using the background of the French Revolution as a time period already. Cool. I, I get that. But now one of my favorite anime is going to have this dark skin, locked up Haitian woman as one of the main characters. It was like they decided to turn my girlfriend Aww. into an OC that like I made in like a separate universe. It's beautiful. Castlevania Nocturne surprised me though. They really used the setting of real historical events to both its advantage and effectiveness. We again aren't one to one with the game story here, but I don't, I don't really mind. Of course, there were plenty of folk up in arms about the liberties that the team took with this story. A lot of them had fair issues with, you know, how the season ended up being, and even some that I would agree with. Honestly, I'd still recommend this show, like I said. The great part about it is that you don't even need to watch the first four seasons to enjoy this new one. But let's be real, people fly through 10 episode seasons these days, let alone just 8. And with the story that they were trying to tell, the entire time I just felt like, wow, we could have really used like three or four more episodes here. I can't believe this is about to be done. Just, you know, to allow room for the story to breathe a little bit. I'm honestly just surprised that one of Netflix's most popular animated shows didn't get the time it deserves. But then I'm reminded of how other shows in general are treated on Netflix, how other animated shows are treated on Netflix. And yeah, yeah. But then there was a portion of the audience upset at the fact that they were seeing characters of various skin tones across their screen. And that, in particular, being black now, shocked many of the fans that the source material were, and that is white. I still haven't played Rondo of Blood personally, but doing my research on her in the games has led me to the conclusion that these niggas tripping. Regardless about how you feel about Annette's story in Nocturne, I'm not arguing with nobody, with anyone that's complaining that she was even changed in the first place. This white woman right here has no character in the games. She's a story device for the main character, Richter, to attain after defeating a great evil. Giving a character who originally had no arc at all a radically new one is a good thing. And yes, I don't care how biased being Haitian makes me here. By proxy of using a Nets character arc to adapt the Haitian Revolution into the show, it's already plenty more interesting than what's already been known with the character, which is getting kidnapped, I guess. They actually don't sugarcoat anything, showcasing massive plantations, the extreme caste system that establishes your place in the hierarchy based on how much whiteness you inherited. But you know, since it's the vampire killing anime, the vampires are both the slave owners and Porter Prince and the aristocracy letting their citizens starve in the streets of Paris. Which, I mean, what better way to adapt people who take up these positions than bloodthirsty monsters who use the Shroud of Darkness to plot on those they see as beneath them? Nah, but seriously, let's get into Annette. She's easily my favorite character now between both series, edging out the role that Cypher once held. Still my girl, but you understand. Her story begins in childhood in Saint-Domingue, entangled by the overwhelming despair of enslavement. Annette was often found listening to the lullabies of her mother, lullabies that supplicate for the protection against the absolute worst of the slave owners. Unfortunately, she would witness the murder of her mother at the hands of a vampire slave owner, Vaublanc. Vaublanc overheard Annette's mother and her connection to her heritage back in Africa enraged him. After finding proof of symbols of their religion in their home, he forcibly kills Annette's mother to establish dominance. This of course wouldn't prevent her from attempting to have her own escape from the plantation. Before she could be punished for attempting to liberate herself, Annette's innate powers manifest and she summons the power of Ogun, the divine being or Orisha of iron and war. Mother and father actually both passed down Yoruba Orisha heritage. 
So her dad had Ogun and her mom had Orumila, the Orisha of Wisdom. She's basically Haitian Hercules, except instead of super strength, she can manipulate rocks and metals to form structures and weapons. She's also got healing spells and Final Fantasy level summons from the voodoo magic she can do. So it's probably more accurate to call her a Haitian earthbending Edward Elric. Her twin machete fighting style is most likely a reference to T.A. Machete, the real life fencing technique used by Haitian Maroons to compensate for their lack of advanced weapons against their adversaries in the 17th and 18th centuries. I'm gonna put a documentary about T.A. Machete in the description for anyone interested in learning more about this just random but cool ass fighting style. I'm not even 100% certain about the reference here, but the major point I'm making is that it lends to Annette's design and story even if it is untouchable. Hunted for sport, Annette manages to escape being caught by Vaublanc and his men by sneaking into a nearby opera house. The main performer there that evening was Edouard, a mixed race man with an undeniably angelic voice. With cunningness, Edouard extends solidarity to this random girl in his midst and is able to hide her in an instrument case. He's revealed to be a part of the Maroons and organizes for her to be taken to one of their bases for her to aid the eventual revolutionary effort. It's here that Annette comes into her own with her powers, gets a whole training arc and everything. Cecile Fatima is like her whole sensei, training her on how to control her strength, it all makes total sense contextually with history and is objectively cool as hell to see adapted this way. Honestly surprised I haven't spoken much Haitian Creole in this video yet, but one phrase that I would like to teach anybody who's watching if they don't know already is coupe tete boule kai. Coined most likely by Jean-Jacques Dessalines, a future leader in the revolution, it directly translates to cut off the head, burn down the house. And it's as easy to comprehend as it sounds. It became a broad motivation utilized by enslaved folk across the island to hold nothing back against their oppressors. In the anime's case, that includes vampires. Annette, Edouard, and thousands of enslaved folk mobilized to fight for freedom and keep that exact same energy. Annette and Edouard in particular find Vaublanc and engage in battle. However, Vaublanc is able to escape by turning into a bat, finding his way into the aristocracy, and growing a vampire cult in France currently. Cecile, soon after the fighting, begins having a massive vision about a vampire messiah soon to come, and orders Annette to venture to Paris herself to prevent the evil from taking over Europe and potentially the rest of the world. Her and Edouard arrive in France and join Richter Belmont in his destined quest to defeat the soon coming threat, going from run revolution to being on mission in another one. Some of you may not be privy to it, but the Haitian and French revolutions are quite linked in nature. Obviously, France is the country that's colonizing Haiti, but the ramifications of declaring all men free and equal at the tail end of the French revolting led to a dialogue about the inherent ambiguity of who that very freedom would be extended to. The French who were maintaining plantations in Saint-Domingue were thrilled to hear about the opportunity such a declaration gave, yet in their albeit predictably limited sense, did not anticipate that all the slaves they owned there and frankly in any of the French colonies would contain a desire for self-determination from a heinous system. Many free blacks at the time were already advocates for equality amongst them. A failed rebellion occurred in France, led by Vincent Auguet, in which people fought and died in the streets for the right to vote. It was becoming abundantly clear that the ambiguity within the Declaration of Rights of Man was a sign towards free black men hell, any black people in general, that they were not going to be given any rights. Many could see that the writing was on the wall here. Now we're well within to the Atlantic slave trade at this point. These are conversations that are being had that aren't relatively new in the grand scheme of things. But as CLR James cites in Black Jacobins, those with an outside looking in perspective were more equipped to see the ticking time bomb that's subjecting people to slavery and stripping them of their humanity in way too many ways to count. Property owners are the most energetic flag waggers and patriots in every country, but only so long as they enjoy their possessions. To safeguard those, they desert God, King, and country in the twinkling. Gabriel Wichetti, Comte de Mirabeau, philosopher and key figure in the French Revolution, 
damn near insisted that free people of color were entitled to the same rights as white plantation owners. White literally was counting down the days until the Frenchman, who ruled the left half of Hispaniola with an iron fist, would be apprehended by the force of 500k enslaved people. He compared his time visiting the island to sleeping at the foot of Vesuvius. It was not looking like this was just going to go away. So now they, that's where the turnaround is seen is because now they're training these men in this kind of warfare. And these men want to win. And, you know, the winning is more important than, than, than living. Um, you know, in the same podcast episode, you know, we talk about the personality of that revolution, right? And why it's such a big deal as far as, like, the spirituality behind it all. You, you got to realize, right, like, these French men, they wrote in their diaries and they also wrote to their family members about what was going on. Because, you know, the expectation was is that, okay, we're having a little issue in Haiti or Saint-Domingue at that time. We're having some issue in Saint-Domingue, so we're just going to go take care of it real quick and then we'll come back. No, that wasn't the case at all. To get a better perspective on the relationship between the unreality of a successful slave revolt and the multifaceted, all-encompassing nature of this history, I had a chat with Renel Augustin, an educator and historian out of South Florida. He hosts his own podcast, Rio Talks, that delves into various events within politics and social justice. It's where he also broadcasted his own anthology series, breaking down the Haitian Revolution and some of its key figures. Success, um, obviously enough to start their own nation, but we got to remember this is something that starts in 1791. The original individuals who are participating in the beginning of this, most of them aren't even alive to see it come to fruition. Um, now, what makes Bois super interesting is that, as we all know, there was a ceremony that was done at the time to channel the um, the god of war, uh, or the Lua, if they, as they like to call it. Um, and, you know, there's a super spiritual uh, background to it. And, you know, there's two different sides on that argument. Some people will say without that, revolution ain't won. Others will say it's because of that, that Haiti never really reached the... The, the potential that it could have reached. So it all really depends on who you ask um, as to the legacy of Wakaima. But one thing that either side can't deny is that it, it, it does mark the beginning of the revolution. That's, that's where the plans were made, the ceremony happened, and you know each person was given, I believe, five or seven stones. And they told her every day to drop a stone. And then when you have no more stones on that day is the day that we start. Right, and um, you know, it, it, it's super significant. I think the, the location as well, for people who haven't been there, it's, it's a swamp, it's a swampy area. Um, it's infested with the crocodiles, alligators, and, and, and the such. And that's where they decided to meet because they knew that's the only place they could go without the French plantation society seeing what was going on. So that's how bad they wanted freedom. To me, that's kind of what I take from it. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with being in this area that's infested with these animals that could kill me. Uh, but for freedom, this is where we're going to meet and this is where we're going to make it happen. You know, yeah. and, I, and I think that that attitude from that night carries on for the next 14, 13, 14 years until, you know, the slaves attain their freedom. Attain their freedom. Now, Ronell and I were really able to chop it up for a few minutes. So if you want to watch the full interview, I posted it on to my Patreon. Uh, it's only $3 a month. If anybody wants to join, feel free. I would love to. It would definitely motivate me to keep making videos. Okay, back to what I was doing. Yo, mother lamb overrun. My gun heavy, I'm about to unload. This is an ode to Haiti. Mozambique, Martinique, Trinidad, Grenada, wherever black people sleep. Pray for them, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. And that's role in this particular adaptation of the French Revolution can't go ignored. Yeah, she's obviously a main character, but the background of being raised in Haiti provides a salient POV for the similar happenings between her home and the country that chose to colonize her people. Luckily, it looks like the up-and-coming revolutionaries in France were willing to listen to a black woman and become inspired by her. Egun Mojuba. Ancestors, I give respect. I am not a revolutionary leader. I am a girl who used to be a slave until slavery could be endured no longer. We lit a spark 
A few of us at first hiding in the mountains, but the sugar and tobacco fields had dried out in the sun. And the spark lit a flame, and then the flame was an inferno, and all their power and cruelty crumbled before us. The juxtaposition between liberation and those that oppose it between both lands also reveals itself in the religious commentary of the show. Castlevania is no stranger to being a critic of the church, specifically the Catholic Church in its media. Many might say so, but I wouldn't go as far to say the show is anti-religion or even anti-Christian in nature. Christianity without a doubt holds an undeniable destructive role within colonialism, God, gold, and glory, and whatnot. You add in monster killing and yeah, where else are the Belmonts gonna get their holy water and crosses? The games might be a little bit more forgiving to the consequences of New World Evangelism, but in the show and, you know, actual real life, it would be foolish to assume that the church always represents the good guys, especially from the perspective of major historical events. So it makes sense then in that this show's context, the church continues the role of antagonism and is even directly involved in the vampire cult nonsense happening in Paris. In reality, tensions existed for a while between Catholicism and voodoo practitioners on the topic of European essentialism and favoritism amongst the elite by the church. Though in recent times there has been a lot more of a concerted effort by the Catholic Church to treat marginalized people better, religion and the other arms of colonialism undeniably have left scars contributing to the very unreality the revolution took part in. The revolution as a whole is often placed beneath a lens that undermines its impact by simultaneously mystifying its occurrence. Michel Wolf Tuyo is a Haitian anthropologist who wrote about the dissonance between the shortcomings as a result of being rejected as a free republic by the Western world and the overwhelming role that the West upholds in placing those shortcomings on Haiti to begin with. One of his best works, The Odd and the Ordinary, Haiti, the Caribbean, and the world sums up the relationship perfectly. Though not at the privy of non-native writers, the fiction that Haiti escapes analysis and comprehension emerged out of the minds of European and North American observers, mostly white males, who wrote about Haiti in the early 19th century, at the time when the very existence of a black state that had issued from anti-colonial revolution appeared to them as an aberration. Haitian exceptionalism has been a shield that masks the negative contribution of the Western powers to the Haitian situation. Haitian exceptionalism functions as a shield to Haiti's integration into a world dominated by Christianity, capitalism, and whiteness. The more Haiti appears weird, the easier it is to forget that it represents the longest neocolonial experiment in the history of the West. These scars, physical, mental, spiritual, are made manifest in the character of Vaublanc. As the show progresses, it's made really clear that he's only in France now, you know, helping to summon this vampire, evil, messiah, monster thing due to the fear of his slaves on the island and now the peasants in the streets of Paris finally reaching self-determination. Vesuvius has finally erupted and this loser of a man can't handle the heat. Annette corners him in France with the intention of gaining intel on the cult and finally getting her chance to exact revenge on one of her personal oppressors. She already lost her chance earlier when she found out he was there, leading to the supposed death and capture of Edouard. This time, there was no way she was going to let this chance slip by. Forming crosses using the fence held up in the graveyard, she traps Vaublanc in a cage and interrogates him on everything he knows. Vaublanc remembers exactly who she is and remains steadfast in a commitment to the superiority of whites and even non-humans over black slaves. He curses her and revels in the fact that he killed her mother, all within a pathetic, natural high, crazed rant, praising the coming of his vampire messiah, just having a plain old yap session at this point. Oh my god. Despite all this, Annette stands tall and victorious, subjecting this monster to the punishment he and plantation owners just like him suffered. Something between divine retribution and righteous, swift justice. The sun is rising, devouring the darkness. It always does. 
This is the natural order. Beyond our shared heritage, Annette works so well because at no point does she feel like a character particularly unique to her situation. Like there are plenty of other real life freedom fighters from Haiti that could have easily been placed in her position in the show and would have likely been as impactful simply due to the distinctive nature of Haiti's revolution. And a couple of examples, talks about a young man who was 19 years old who, you know, it's three men. The, the one that we're talking about in particular is 19. I'm pretty sure the other two men are around that same age range. And they their penalty for whatever it was that they did was they were to be burned to death. And while the three was standing there, the other two men quickly start trying out for help and screaming and stuff like that. And then the man, the 19-year-old boy, we're going to say man because he's over 18, says directly, and he says it in Creole, you all don't know how to die. Let me show you. And he turns and walks deeper into the fire. Doesn't utter a sound, nothing, right? They also would kidnap women and children and try to like torture them to get information out of them. One such woman that they had, they had her up set up on the, on the stool and were about to take the stool from under her so she could pass. They were like, listen, tell us the stuff or you're gonna have to, or we're just gonna have to hang you. And the lady said straight up to them, you don't know how sweet it is to die for liberty. And then she proceeded to hang herself. Mm. You know what I mean? And and on top of that, like, you know, it how they're explaining it is, is the man writes, this is what we're going against. Right? We're going against men who in battles, you know, in battles they got the drums and they have the chants and stuff. He's like, in battle, we have men who are literally yelling out, you know, to the attack grenadier who gets killed. That's his affair. Forget your mother, forget your father right to the attack grenadier who gets killed that's his affair so essentially it's look we're together but you know we're fighting to the death we ain't worried about family we're not worried about anything else but getting to our our end objective here which is just freedom you know what i mean I i'm not gonna lie to you when you when you have you know career military men as the french were because the french were considered the best uh army in the land at that time you know these are paid men they're they're practically mercenaries and you're going against guys who are doing it for the free and not only are doing it for the free they are emotionally invested in making sure that they win this war like that's that's major you know what i mean you're not winning too many wars like that when i look at annette i'm reminded of people like suzanne belair Suzanne Arsenite, as she became known as, was a lieutenant in Toussaint Louverture's army towards the end of the war, working alongside her husband, General Charles Billet. Unfortunately, upon some question mark double crossing at the hands of Dessalines and a surprise attack in the apartment of La Tribonite, Sanite was captured and delivered onto the French army. Charles reluctantly joined her in her sentencing after learning of his wife's capture. On October 5th, 1802, the Belairs would be sentenced to death, Charles to be killed by firing squad, while Sanite was to face the guillotine. Despite their fate truly being sealed at this moment, this couple remained steadfast in their commitment to each other and the movement. Sanite in particular was ten toes down. Despite her willingness to be a part of the fight, the French only sentenced her to a beheading due to her gender. But she absolutely refused any different treatment and refused to die any other way than a soldier's death, albeit a male one. During Charles's execution, Sanite was heard telling her husband to die bravely as she watched. Her final words facing down the barrel of the colonizer's gun were Vive Liberté, en bas esclavage. Long live liberty, down with slavery. During that time period, firing squad executions usually had criminals blindfolded, but the both of them opted out most likely to burn resolve into the enslaved who were watching a execution happen right in front of them. Sanite was only 21, 15 when she joined the army, and she wasn't even enslaved at the time. That spirit doesn't come out of nowhere and can't be extinguished no matter how many layers of oppression weigh it down. Faut bien patience pour lever soleil. We must have patience to raise the sun. Listen, hearing the pain screams of white supremacists is music to my ears too, but its inclusion here is a salient one, reflecting the attitude of by any means necessary. 
For many, the Haitian Revolution then and now represents the fear of people actually liberating themselves from oppression. Many see the no holds barred approach by the Africans to exterminate any semblance of the French elite on Saint Domingue and start clutching their pearls. Even within those with some more sympathy to the oppressed, once that self determination includes retribution for the violence committed against them, they're all like, whoa, whoa, I thought this was a classy party. Paulo Freire's seminal work, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, delves into this talking point and shuts it down as well as anybody could. With the establishment of a relationship of oppression, violence has already begun. Never in history has violence been initiated by the oppressed. How could they be the initiators if they themselves are the result of violence? How could they be the sponsors of something objective, whose objective inauguration called forth their existence as oppressed? There would be no oppressed had there been no prior violence to establish their subjugation. Additionally, Frantz Fanon always talked about how violence exists as a tool for the oppressed to realize their own agency. And it is clear that in the colonial countries, the peasants alone are revolutionary, but they have nothing to lose and everything to gain. The starving peasant outside the class system is the first among the exploited to discover that only violence pays. For him, there is no compromise, no possible coming to terms. Colonization and decolonization is simply a question of relative strength. With implications of restorative justice being enacted this way, it's not surprising to find that the Haitian Revolution still remains scarce as far as adaptations are confirmed. Not many are willing to go in depth with the nuance, being the first independent black republic in history, so I get it. Despite their efforts post revolution, Haiti still faces various forms of oppression to this very day even amongst each other in the form of dictators and additional agents of chaos within the government. Beyond perceptions of voodoo being bastardized from US imperialism, beyond the consequences of instilling an exuberant debt of 560 million in today's money that still hasn't been canceled to this day. When you say free Haiti, it means recognizing the manufactured disarray coordinated from it being two decades since a legitimate democratic election with the West installing puppet leaders that get disposed of shortly after the damage is done. Recognizing gangs terrorizing innocent civilians while toting American imported blickies for what it truly is. There have been recent efforts by imperialist powers to enforce control over the country with foreign police battalions from nations like Kenya and various Caribbean countries? Question mark? Question mark? To quote unquote resolve issues directly caused by imperialism rearing its ugly head in the first place. It's like its own version of a proxy war, but like, black. Free Haiti includes charging against modern imperialism, even if the foot soldiers enforcing it are from neighboring islands. When you say Free Haiti, you're invoking a generation-spanning conflict centered on concepts like self-reliance and autonomy. The current struggles of the nation of Haiti mirror many of the other struggles that appear within a 200 plus year long history. The kind of resolve found in Annette, Sanité, and so many other freedom fighters of the past can still be seen today. In times of perpetual despair, I welcome shows like Castlevania Nocturne utilizing the complex history Haiti has to tell a story both familiar with the historical context and also entrenched in its own narrative of recognizing one's self-worth and how that self-worth can be actualized in a community of like-minded individuals. One day, Haiti, Congo, Sudan, Palestine, these lands ingrained in oppression and despair will soon see themselves on the other side of liberation. The fight back to do so will always be justified. Here's hoping the next season not only gets put out, but that we also get a further deep dive into Haiti's history. And if a couple bloodsucker demons need to be handled to do so, Hupetet Bulekai. Um, of course, shout out to my students who watch this. I know they love it. I get that they do, but they never really do. Um, <laughs> but I do appreciate the the fake love, so to say. And of course, yeah. you know, shout out, shout out to the people that support Real Talks. You know, what I mean, I'll be I'll be back with the podcast episode soon enough. I know a lot of people have been asking, so. The streets we'll, is waiting. Yeah, I know they are. They are. So <laughs> we'll be coming out with one real soon, promise.